Uh, my name is Alex Hilton. Um, I run an industry body called the Cloud Industry Forum. We talk about the advocacy, trust, transparency and delivery of cloud services uh, in the business community primarily, so we don't really kind of get into the consumer side of things so much. Um, I've got a really strong collection of panelists uh, here and uh, I'm going to open up to them in a second. Just a couple of things, if I may, before I introduce all the panelists. One of, one of the things that we do is produce research that talks about cloud adoption rates and trends and so forth in the marketplace. Um, now, one of the things that we've looked at specifically is what's happening in the UK market and the latest research that we produced, um, just to kind of bring this back down to earth in terms of what we see happening in the market right now. 84% um, of businesses are using some kind of cloud service, cloud-based technology, materially using some kind of cloud-based technology within, within the, their business right now. For, um, uh, of those within larger organizations, enterprise organizations, about 96% utilization. So actually we're finding the enterprises are using it more than small businesses, which I think is kind of interesting, whereas new businesses, uh, in my opinion, would be daft to do anything else other than using cloud-based technology and services. I'll get the panel to e expand on their views of cloud and definitions and so on in a minute for you. 75% um, of businesses, says our research, uh, identify, uh, identify security as the number one risk, the number one barrier, the number one inhibitor to use of cloud services. And again, we'll kind of get into that hopefully as we go through this uh, as well. Um, however, 83% is the last stat, 83% of organizations um, identify improved reliability of their IT as one of the biggest pluses, the biggest drivers of using, uh, utilizing cloud services. So it's a mixed message in there. You know, in essence, people are going there and they're going there very quickly, but there's also some, some barriers and some problems that I think we need to overcome. So I'm going to, I didn't realize there are six seats, so I'm going to go and sit down with the panel here and we'll, we'll, we'll drive this uh, from here. But I would like to start, Tim, perhaps you'd like to lead off with just each of the panel introducing themselves, uh, who they are and where they are from. Yeah, Tim Wadey from Logicalis. Uh, we uh, both operate a, we call it a cloud, but it's really a hosting platform, a shared hosting platform ourselves, and we build solutions based on the same principles for our clients. Hi, I'm Giles Phelps from Spectrum Internet. We're basically a business ISP offering high performance internet connections, lease lines, and broadband connections to enterprises and SMEs. Hi, I'm uh, David Corbell. I'm a uh, sales specialist for cloud services at Telefonic UK. Um, you'll know us as O2 in the UK. Um, because you know us, you'll know we span from consumer through to the enterprise. Personally, I work in the enterprise space and we provide lots and lots of different ICT services such as wide area networks, connectivity and cloud services to our enterprise customers. Hi, I'm Ian Massingham. I'm from Amazon Web Services. It's the cloud computing unit of Amazon.com, which I'm sure you'll all probably be customers of already. Uh, we have over a million customers that have made use of AWS around the world in the last 30 days. Organizations from Airbnb and Tinder to the FT, Novartis and Shell are amongst our customers. Uh, and we have uh, 11 regions around the world from which we deliver services. So we're a global provider of cloud computing services, one of the leaders in the segment. And I'm Simon Hansford. I'm a founder and CEO of a business called Skyscape Cloud Services. We're a three-year-old business that purely focuses on UK public sector, exclusively our client base in that area. Great. Thanks, Simon. Okay, we've got to juggle the microphones a little bit around as we go through here, but you've got a really knowledgeable audience here, so I do encourage you to, to get involved. If, if you've got any questions throughout, I'm really happy for you to throw your hands up. I'm going to steer us through some of this initially, but please do uh, wave a hand and I, I will get a microphone to you and we'll come back to that sort of more formally at the end. The, the title of this session has been described, as you've seen and heard, as uh, the, the description of uh, you know, tech, technology as a service, uh, let's broaden it and call it IT as a service, perhaps. Um, I'm very keen that, because we've got such a really knowledgeable panel here, that we're trying to get into some real life scenarios as well. So where the panel have examples of customers, they may be anonymous, but customer um, uh, solutions uh, that, that, you know, or customers who've experienced some real benefits, it'd be great to pull some of those things out as well. But I think the first point, uh, and maybe Tim, we don't certainly have to keep going in this manner, so let's jump around as we can as any of the panel have other questions or answers they want to give, then please do jump in. But the first one really, I think, is just to get some definitions straight. Uh, when we're talking about this, this tech as a service, IT as a service, cloud, 
Uh, where do you, you want to kind of lead off on this? There's a lot of definitions in there. Let's just kind of make sure we're all on the same page with what we're talking about here, Tim. Do you want to lead on that? So, so I think that's a, a great point to start with because we've actually invented a whole new language around this. You know, it starts with software as a service, infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, and you can go on. Um, and I think it's down to the customers, the end clients. You know, we have, if you say technology as a service, we have customers that bring an entire outsource, their desktop, the service that goes with that, everything apart from the applications that maybe define their business, which goes off to the specialist house that supports that. Uh, and, and that at its extreme is the as a service message. But you know, if you bite the bit you want, you take 10 servers from Amazon, that gives you a capability to work off that, that allows you to do something to transform your business. You know, and I think it, it's really interesting. We don't silo this, but we actually think about the solutions we each provide to our customers. Okay. Guys, Ian, do you want to jump in with that one? Yeah, sure. So uh, for us at AWS, it's a lot about allowing customer organizations to avoid things that are undifferentiating. You know, we often describe it as undifferentiated heavy lifting. Now, stuff that you do in IT that doesn't really add a whole lot of value to your organization. It's better to consume that as a service, and as you've said, uh, Tim, to free up the resources that you might have spent on that to do things that do genuinely allow you to create things that have value. And that's why a lot of customers use AWS, because they don't want to focus on the low-level activities of planning, building, and operating data centers, or if they're a mobile developer, higher-level activities like building and operating identity management systems for mobile apps. They'd rather just consume these components as services and focus on doing things that really adds value to their organization. That's how we see it. See it. It's about not doing things that aren't important. Okay, cool. Um, Simon, from your point of view, public sector, laggards, right? Not, not at all. Um, I, if anything, it's exactly the opposite today in cloud. Um, so my, my answer to the question is definitions. First, I think education is the biggest single issue that we have in cloud adoption. And that comes down in part to terminology. We all confuse each other by using different terms. So I tend to be a bit of a purist and keep referring people back to NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, and say that's very well defined. In UK government, they've adopted that uh, terminology. Um, I'm particularly focused, like Ian is, probably into the foundation service, which we call infrastructure as a service. Um, it's VMs, it's storage on demand. And today in government and public sector, that's where really all of the interest, all, all of the activity is in that area. It's a foundation. You know, it's the bare, bare bones. <coughs> it is, as Ian said, it's why would anyone want to try and run that themselves? You would use a cloud service, an outsourcer to deliver that. On top of that, you build other services. It might be from a managed service, it might be a platform as a service, it might be software as a service. But the base is that infrastructure that there really is no way uh, the standard organization government department can have the scale that other providers can get to. Okay, so, so David, maybe from your perspective, is it all about the infrastructure, as we've heard a little bit about here? I mean, how, how do we build on top of that? Um, Yes, it's all about the infrastructure. Of course, it is. That's that's the that's the heartbeat that runs everything. Um, I think, from our point of view, it's about the infrastructure, but not just in the we're an ISP or we're a service provider. Let's not forget. So for us, it's about the you know, the lines that connect everything together, the wide area network or the internet service that connects these things together. Make sure those are architected in the right way to give the users the best experience. Um, I think for me, the we, we talk about as a service, tech as a service, IT as a service. Tech as a service is a bit of a strange term, and that is. In my eyes, anything you consume, it can be, you know, Hotmail, for example, could be considered a tech as a service. Uh, even your phone line in your house could be considered to be a tech as a service. Um, I think IT as a service is a more interesting concept because that really defines a, an operational governance model, a way of working to enable you to consume those services from cloud providers and, and others. Um, the reason I think it's so exciting to be in this, this part of the industry, and I've been around for quite a while, is that... It's the biggest change I see, the shift towards cloud services, is the biggest change I see since we've moved away from the mainframe 30 years ago. It really, really is changing the way we go about business. It's changing the, um, 
the value of the IT department as well from being a cost centre, a tax on the business. People often talk about IT as the necessary evil to being a real value generator and a, a driver of innovation for your, for your business. So, so okay, to that, to that end, maybe Giles, you want to pick this one up. How, how do we, we talked about the differentiation from, let's say, mainframe, thin client technology, um, you know, lots of variations that we've seen, outsourcing. Isn't, isn't that really what cloud technology is about, all of those things? Where, where, where's the difference here? Why does it stand out now? Well, I think that's one of the interesting things in that we've, um, we've come across a lot of terms like we refer to pi private cloud and public cloud, and some of it is just a new name on, on something we did before. Um, hosting, for instance, which we used to say there was a, a data center with some servers located in it. It's very hard to differentiate between what's now a cloud service, how what defines a cloud service. We're all used to it. We're all using it. Um, it is interesting going back. We were almost running full circle to a time when there were mainframes. Their offices are dotted around the country, and it was connected into a single point, if you like, and they were drawing their IT services from that single point. All that's happened now is generally that single point is, is grown. It's now a global phenomenon. So there's, there might be one point in, in the globe, if you like, that everybody draws their services from. But there is, no, there is no clear definition as far as I'm concerned. And I think with SMEs in particular, it's to understand that the technology as a service is anything related to their technology that helps their business, that can drive their business forward and how it's delivered. Um, and they've just got to get used to the fact that it's here. It's here to stay. They're already using it, whether they're using LinkedIn, whether they're using Facebook or anything like that. We're all starting to use cloud services. And it's here. It's just take it as a service regardless of whether it's infrastructure, whether it's software as a service or hardware as a service, it doesn't really matter. It's just all about the technology and the fact you now don't have to look after the, the nuts and bolts. You just use it for the best, best um, opportunity for your business. Okay, so, so when we kind of get into the world of you know, the commercial benefits um, here, I think what I'm hearing you say is it's taken away a lot of the mundane activities that perhaps were, were quite heavy uh, on, on the workforce and the IT community and so on within business in the past. Is that fair to say? Ian, maybe you can pick this one up. Um, what are, you know, outside of, outside of just making life a little bit easier for the IT people, uh, what are the commercial benefits? Why would I be doing this? Well, uh, the first thing, of course, is that you're not going to be investing CapEx in cloud computing services. You're going to be metered and you're going to be paying for the service that you consume or the services that you have consumed in a lot of cases. I think that is one thing that's fundamentally different from tradition traditional hosting. The immediacy of w with which you can provide service, the fact that the services are wrapped in an API, which means you've got lots of different mechanisms that you can control, orchestrate, and consume services where it's actually very difficult, different to traditional hosting. And that is one of the things that enables this consumption-based commercial model where no capex, opex, and it's metered as you use it. The second thing that comes with that programmability, of course, is I mean, the level of agility that you get with these services is incomparable to anything that's gone before. That's one of the massive changes here. You can literally provision and destroy resources by the minute that you need them. You can pay for them, in the case of AWS, by the hour on consumption. So it's a totally different model for developers, a totally different model for people who want to build platforms on top of cloud services that just equips technology professionals and developers with a set of resources that they can orchestrate, compose, and use when they need them, and then dispose of them and stop paying for them when they don't. That is totally different to anything that's gone before, in my view. Okay, cool. Tim, do you want to jump in? Yeah, actually, one of the things that struck me when we started looking at this was, was a, a statistic that came out of Amazon. Um, before they built uh, AWS, uh, its predecessor, um, their developers spent 70% of their time on infrastructure issues and 30% cutting code. And when they looked at those numbers afterwards, they flipped it round. So they effectively doubled the efficiency of those coders in terms of doing their primary job. And it's when you take that principle of, you know, it comes in a very limited number of, of, of formats and you apply that to things like the Windows image. You know, if everyone is running the same Windows image at the same revision, not in one customer, but across several of our customers, we only have to build that image and test it and patch it once, and we know that it then works across all of them. Uh, and it starts to, to, to spread those mundane tasks, the burden of them across a number of customers, uh, and that just makes life easier. Great, okay, so, so, so kind of leading on from there, Simon, I'd be interested in your view, certainly with the public sector in mind on this one, in terms of the finances around it. Um, 
in, in my experience, when I was first talking with you know, customers about cloud technology, the advice was don't go down this, if you think you're just going to save a lot of money, because it's not necessarily going to be it. Now, I think that is starting to change a little bit. I don't know, Simon, do you want to comment on that one? What are your views? I, I think there's um, well pub numerous well-published examples where government public sector say that they are saving significant money uh, on a like-for-like -like comparison. So Mike Bracken from GDS is on record of saying that you know, the gov.uk, how they host that today, compared with three years ago where there were 650 websites uh, located at different hosting outsourcers, they believe they've saved over 90% to moving up to the cloud. DVLA down in Swansea I believe that they've, uh, again, Oliver's on record of saying you know, they've made a 60% saving of adopting cloud uh, over their traditional way of delivering. I think probably more important, it's the intangibles or, or the much harder to um, put a financial uh, benefit to it. So I always say the number one benefit to cloud computing is agility. It gives you the ability to be more agile in what you do. Um, you know, I've got examples again down in Swansea where developers used to wait you know, up to three months for boxes, servers to be provisioned for them uh, so they could do test and development. Yeah? They're doing that in minutes today. Yeah? So they're able to do new things faster in a different way. They enjoy their job more, I believe. Yeah? So to put a financial number on that is relatively hard to do, or it's, it's hard for some, uh, an accountant to quantify that, but very, very important. Great. Okay, good answer. Guys, anybody else like to jump in on the financing? Ian? Yeah, I'll just add a few more examples if you want. So uh, the Financial Times, obviously a global, uh, now mostly digital business publication. They migrated a large-scale data warehouse to our platform that they use for content targeting. So it's uh, personalization on their digital products. You've read an article, you might like this one as well, because other people that read the article also read this one. They took 80% of the cost out of that system by migrating it onto an AWS service called Redshift, which is a service for running data warehouse workloads inside AWS. Uh, Samsung, the smart TV platform, they launched on AWS. They mitigated $30 million of capital expenditure in their data centers by building a consumer product in the cloud. Uh, here in Wales, one of our partners, Skybrid, have done an initial assessment with the Welsh government, and they've calculated there's 57% savings on the table for the Welsh government if they migrate services onto the AWS cloud platform. So there's a ton of examples in cost savings. What's also interesting is the, and this is to your point really, Simon, the potential value of being first to market, of being quicker or more agile than competitors. And there's lots of good examples of startups bootstrapping in the cloud. Uh, Slack is a big customer of ours. They're the fastest company in history to reach a $2 billion valuation. They run very, very large components of their system on the AWS platform. And this is all about rapidly evolving software products in an almost evolutionary manner and using many, many development environments, really highly empowered and equipped developers that can use the platform directly to build the products on. I think there's a lot of value there for, for smaller startup organizations as well. I think from my point of view that this is probably the most exciting part because what we've actually done is now leveled the playing field completely so that a startup or a small company now has the same resources as an enterprise who's probably spent millions of pounds on technology. And so certainly it's quite relevant for, for Wales where we have a, a, a huge SME community. So they can now for pounds or even in some instances free take services that previously enterprises would have spent millions on. So I think we have an opportunity to really grow and develop business. And it really does make the, the larger companies think about how agile they are. They now have to react to these startup companies who can come along and do things very, very quickly. And how do we react and change our business model to, to take advantage of it as well? So I think it, it, it's certainly probably one of the biggest areas of change because now everybody's having to completely rethink their, their, their digital model. And it was interesting, I noticed uh, this morning, John Chambers, the outgoing CEO of Cisco, said that potentially in the next 10 years, four out of 10 companies just won't exist. And I think that's down to the fact that you can use a lot of cloud-based services and new startups are gonna come along, totally disrupt the norm. And I think it's an exciting opportunity for anybody at this point. Anybody has an equal chance of, of, of really making good. Yeah, just to add to that if I can as well, um, the, the commercial benefit we're speaking about, I mean, 
back when we first started talking about virtualization rather than cloud, it, it, all the benefit is about sweating assets to a greater extent and improving the utilization. Of course, the, 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 the advent of cloud it add, adds in management layers and, yeah, ultimately cost. <clears throat> I think what we've got better at as an industry and IT departments have got better at themselves is measuring the, the softer costs, the saving of the softer costs, the operational expenditure, the freeing up the 70% of the uh, developer's time on infrastructure infrastructure. Um, the, the agility for me, I'm banging on about this every day with my customers, the agility is absolutely key. Um, if, if you don't take advantage of the agility that cloud offers, your competitors will, is ultimately the message, isn't it? <clears throat> and if, you, if, if you're lagging behind your competitors, you'll, you'll, ultimately you'll fail. But I see now most people recognize the agility that cloud services can bring. And uh, some are able to re really benefit from those. Many, though, aren't able to align their own business processes to the, to the added agility of a cloud service and say, right, we can spin up new services in minutes. But our business processes don't let us do that. Our business processes are holding us back and it's still taking, it's not taking the three months as it was before, but it's still taking a number of weeks, and that's too slow. You know, it's the equivalent of putting a Formula One engine in a Ford Fiesta. It's, it doesn't work. Yeah, I mean, I think. Uh, um you need to. Uh, my advice would be to think about your business in terms of what you know the requirements are. Whether you are a, you know, a peak period business that has big hits at Christmas or, or whatever it might be. If you're in the retail side of it, if you're one of the things we we've talked about in the cloud industry forum has been because um, it was a, it was an award winner that we had at a cloud awards event that we did a year ago, which was UCAS, the University Clearing System, which runs on AWS uh, and Azure. I think actually it's jointly. Uh, I'm afraid. But, uh, but uh, regardless, you know, the university clearing system, when all the kids get their A-level results coming in, there's this burst of 24 hours. 98% in one day, the annual load, they have 98% of it consolidated in one day. 98% of the load in one day, Ian says, right? So a huge hit of students trying to find the right university to go to, classic burst technology, uh, comic relief, you know, Red Nose Day classic one as well. That's all open source cloud-based technology that they're using there for the, certainly the 24 hours or 12 hours, 8 hours, whatever it is that they run the TV program, but you know, the week or two either side of it as well. So, so there's those kind of scenarios that are burst-based. There's other scenarios though outside of that. What I was interested to get into with, with the panel actually, and I, Simon, you addressed the point very well, which I think started this off down this agility route here. Uh, one of the things that we measured in our research was this intangible piece. Okay. So uh, we actually talked in our research about 96% of customers said the intangible benefits are very clear to us, uh, if that doesn't make complete lack of sense. But, uh, you know, so the intangibles are coming through now, and those intangibles are things like collaboration, better improved customer service, collaboration internally, not just externally, and so on as well. But I kind of want to look at the other side of this, which is the inhibitors. Uh, and the concerns and the worries about this. You know, we hear all the stories about the, there was the stuff, we talked about cybersecurity in one of the sessions earlier, talking about the, one of the US uh, departments, the uh, HR hack that went on there, uh, the Sony stuff, Xbox, all of these types of scenarios. Uh, Jennifer Lawrence, um, <laughs> draw your own conclusions around this one. Security, right? Is cloud safe? Tim, let's, maybe you lead off on this one. Uh, is, it, is it really safe? So, so is anything really safe? <laughs> You know, and, 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 and I think that's what we have to say about what we build on premise. And unless you go back to sort of some of those really early principles of sticking a, a computer on its own in the middle of an empty room, you know, nothing is totally safe. It's how you build that out and the components you use to, to stop people's data mixing with each other, to stop people getting into your data. You know, and, and uh, things like um, VMware and some of the, the, the Cisco products have been through the accreditations with both the US and the UK authorities to get badges. You know, the, the great EAL4 badge on a Cisco switch tells you that someone in the US thinks it's safe to keep secret apart, which is actually quite a good measure. So you need to step back from, from what you're building, look at how you're building it, look for the roots in, you know, it, it's great to build something with all the right products to keep them apart on the, on the shared platform, but you've got to then protect the route in with the right level of encryption, the right level of, of, of authentication, you know, and, and put that in place. And it will be different for different data. You know, if it's your banking data, that gets treated differently to something like your Facebook account. But you still need to think about protecting stuff in, in the right way for the data. So, I mean, Giles, there's some things you shouldn't put in the cloud, right? 
Um, I, I'm, I'm actually uh, a big fan of, of putting most things in the cloud, um, mainly because I trust my cloud provider probably more than myself. Um, I think, you know, if, if China decides to hack my laptop, uh, I'm not really going to be able to defend against that very much. Um, so we always look at the, um, because we get involved in the connectivity side of things, we're always saying to our customers, the, the, the most, the biggest chance of sort of an attempt to get into your data is most likely going to come through the end user and, and the endpoint, the laptop or whatever device they're using, rather than going towards the server. Um, the cloud providers have a much greater resource than 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 our clients will have in terms of combating it. And certainly, from our experience, any of the fairly significant breaches that we've had have always targeted a particular person or a user, and it can be very, very personal and very, very targeted. And we've actually seen this in the real world. And, and if it's whether it's a state-sponsored attack or uh, an individual group after some of the data, they will always generally go for the endpoint. So if you've got a server on site, for instance, it is a lot harder to protect that than and potentially if you give it to someone like Amazon and say, can you protect my data? Because you know that their reputation is staked on the back of we have to make our systems as secure as we can um, to to provide a service. So I think the cloud providers are, are very aware of it, um, but it's all down to basically risk limitation. You cannot prevent from 100% guarantee from any kind of hack. You can only reduce risk, and that's what you do. And generally, that's at the end point rather than, than anywhere else. So I'm a big fan of cloud. Okay, so David, from a telco perspective. Yeah, I, yeah, obviously I've got a view on it. Um, uh, so, so you mean cloud is secure, or it should be secure, I should say. It depends on your cloud provider, obviously. Um, if we look at uh, analyst stats today, and we're saying we're seeing that just shy of 50% of CIOs are saying they're going to increase spending on security this year, and just over 40% are saying they're going to increase spending on cloud. Two biggest um, increase areas in spend. And but I think to say that the two are ultimately related is probably doing everyone a bit of a disservice. Um, there are many, many other factors involved in increasing um, our threats and insecurity. Cloud is one, of course, and you know, all of us cloud providers uh, take security very, very seriously. Any breach that AWS or us or anyone else has is, is very, very serious and is instantly in the press, of course. Um, but we also have to consider the way we work today is very different to the way we did 10 years ago, or five years ago even. You know, with the advent, uh, the real adoption of things like unified communications, um, we're sending users out of the workplace. You know, we don't talk about workplaces anymore, we talk about workspaces. Because um, it, it can be Starbucks, or it can be you know, your bedroom, or it can be on a train, or wherever it wants to be, because we, we've, we've achieved that. We've allowed our users to be more mobile. But the, the result of that really is increasing that threat vector as well. It was very, very easy to secure users and their data when they're all sitting in an office you know, behind locked doors. When, when they're not doing that, that threat vector is vastly increased, and cloud is just one of those one of those things. And that that I think is why so many people are focusing on increased spending in security today. Okay, let's carry on going around with this one. I think it's got a big topic, Ian. Sure. So I think uh, maybe slightly counterintuitively, security is another area where scale is really really important. Uh, one of the things that 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 we, that we observe at, at AWS is an effect that I always think of as the highest common denominator effect. So we've got a large number of customers. We mentioned a number of a million users a few minutes ago, uh, and amongst that base, there are some very very demanding organisations. People like Shell, Pfizer, Novartis that are in the pharmaceutical segment, parts of the government, uh, UCAS you've mentioned, but also organisations like the Securities and Exchange Commission in the US. And these customers often tell us, uh, we think you can improve this or that or add a feature for this particular requirement that I have. And what happens with uh, the way we deliver our platform is we develop and engineer these security features and then we make them available for all customers. It's a virtue of this standardization characteristic that you talked about a few minutes ago. So we recently introduced something called KMS, which is a key management service. It was developed directly in response to a request from big customers to improve the way they manage encryption keys in the AWS cloud. So store keys centrally, allow auditing of access to encryption keys, and allow centralized rotation and repudiation, that's cancellation of keys. We've made that available because big customers have asked for it, but if you're an individual startup with two customers, uh, you can go into our console, turn that service on, and then your data's encrypted with the same feature 
that Shell Oil or Pfizer needs to protect their data. And that is a really nice characteristic of the cloud, that the bar keeps getting raised by customers, but every customer benefits from that. So it's perfectly possible to build something in the, in the cloud which surpasses the security level that you would have with traditional on-premises infrastructure. And we hear that from a lot of customers. Once they understand the tools that are at hand, it's better than what, way, way, way better than what they had before in most cases. I, I think you know, we've had some excellent answers there, so I'll try and take a different tack. Um, my favorite book, my must-read book at the moment that I highly suggest you go to your favorite online book reseller to buy. <laughs> <Do you know? laughs> <laughs> um, is called The Phoenix Project. Um, if you run IT or work in IT, The Phoenix Project is a must-read. Go and get it tonight. Um, in there, it talks about um, the go-to person in this IT organization called Brent. Brent, uh, whenever anything went wrong, when anything essential was needed, whether that was the network, whether it was the laptop, what, you know, whatever it was, whether it was security, you go to Brent. Basically, that summarizes many organizations. They kind of have one or two very, very knowledgeable people that you, know, you rely on. When it comes to security in the cloud, you know, companies like ourselves you know, have got teams of people. Our, our reputation stands on it. Um, our customers, you know, name some of my customers on here. Home Office, Ministry of Justice, uh, the people down in Cheltenham. Um, actually, our cyber emergency response team runs their analytics and their response on our platform. These people you know, spend an awful lot of time spend it, sending the spooks down into organizations such as Skyscape to make sure what we say, the pitch, is actually the reality. Yeah, that doesn't happen typically in the size of organizations that you're work, working in. As Ian says, it comes down to scale. Great. Okay, thanks. So some really good insights. Any quick questions anybody in the audience wants to throw up, throw a hand in the air? Okay, we'll, 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 we'll come back to you if you've got them. Um, so please think about them. Um, the other point I really wanted to get into, I suppose, was, you know, just from an advisory perspective, if you're, if you're starting out, I'm going to ask the audience for a quick show of hands as to who's using, using cloud services in a moment, but just a general point to the panel. The advice, what would your advice be when you're talking to customers about this is the first step into the cloud? Where would you go? What would you start with? What would the service be? Is there something you'd recommend there? We talked about that in infrastructure, but can you kind of break that down a little bit more? Quick show of hands in the audience. Who's using cloud services today within their business? Okay, it's about 84%, which I think we mentioned earlier. <laughs> um, uh, guys, Simon, I don't know if you want to lead off with this one in terms of uh, y your advice for, I know you're focused on the public sector primarily, but w what have you experienced as being the first start point for, for your customers? So again, you know, it, it, it depends on your uh, business situation and what you're trying to achieve. Um, certainly as you go out and look at providers, there are you know, hundreds, thousands of cloud providers or that they use the word cloud in their name. The reality is you know, the vast majority of them uh, are using uh, a marketing term called cloud. That we're gonna have massive consolidation in our industry. Um, true cloud providers, there won't be very many of them left uh, globally. I think VMware, who arguably have the predominant underlying technology that most, not all, cloud providers use, um, they claim today there's about 40,000 uh, cloud providers in the world or people that claim to be cloud providers. They think within four years that will be down to about 300 cloud providers. It's going to be a consolidated marketplace. So as you go out there and look at providers, you really need to know that they've got the capability. Um, for, for me, in the market I work in, that's about assurance, about um, certifications, uh, it's about connectivity to PSN, to N3, etc. It's around track record that you've got similar types of customers that you're used to, and it's about industry knowledge. Um, I think those types of specializations become very, very important and allow you know, significant size providers in a relatively small uh, geographies or verticals. Okay, Ian, do you want to 
Uh, yeah, I think. I mean, I think it's really just thinking about you know the advice for the first I think, step. I think the first thing you've got to ask yourself is what is the problem that you're trying to solve or the outcome that you're trying to drive towards, and your technology selection will be really guided by what your requirements are. I would say for many of our customers, those that have adopted what we tend to call a cloud-first strategy of looking at the cloud before other delivery models, even within that kind of strategy, customers will quite often uh, prioritize different acquisition met methods for technology. So they'll look to, is there a software service that I can take that will help me achieve this outcome? If the answer is no and I need to build something, is there a, a set of platform services that I can take advantage of which will help me build a product to achieve this outcome more quickly? And if the answer to those is no, then is there an infrastructure that I can go to where I can compose a set of services myself, like once again, to build a solution that gives me the outcome or the, uh, the set of criteria that I'm looking to, uh, look, looking to achieve here? So that's the filter that we often see customers uh, look at our services and the, the services of other providers through. One thing that I have observed, which I think is quite interesting, is the rise of other platforms that are built on top of AWS. We have a customer here in the UK called Omniphone. If you work in the music industry, you might have heard of these guys. Does anybody here use Spotify or heard of Spotify? The, the Spotify service is partially built on the Omniphone platform. They provide a set of API services that deal with things like music catalog, like uh, rights management, like artist settlement, like search, like album artwork. So if you want to build a music app, you can build it on Omniphone's set of industry-specific platform services, and that in turn runs on top of AWS. And I think that is something that you're going to see increasingly in the future, uh, industry-specific platforms built to help people solve problems in particular vertical markets. OK, interesting. All right, we'll, we'll get into some of the forecasting bit as well, I think, in a minute. So. OK, David. David, did you want to add anything on that? Yeah, sure. Um, I think. My colleagues to my left have really answered the question as I would, to be perfectly honest, um, it, you, with one exception, uh, I will say, which I, which I would say, being from a service provider. Um, I do think flexibility, absolutely, as Ian was alluding to, um, flexibility is absolutely key. Make sure the problem you're trying to solve can be solved with what your provider is offering. Spend time with that. Spend time worrying about the service. And I use the term service very advisedly. Um, so don't worry. Don't worry about underlying technology. Um, I'm, some, I'm, I'm often dismayed when people ask to see the servers in the racks or you know, the, the, go and see the data centers, whatever it is, and see my colleagues here nodding in agreement. Um, it doesn't, that doesn't matter. Um, every, every cloud platform is built to a level and built to a standard and built on industry standard service, apart from AWS, of course, um, who do develop your own, own, own services. But it's a very good point of why we shouldn't be worrying about these things. So focus on the services that are, that are on offer. Make sure they're, uh, they, they match your criteria. Also um, worry about your journey, um, how you're going to get there. So it's very, it's very easy for us as providers to say, this is where you are today, this is where you, this is where you need to be, and sometimes forget about the bit in the middle of how you're going to get there. So make sure you're, you're talking to someone who's going to help you on that journey. Because it's not, it's not always an easy journey. You'll probably find that 80% of it will be quite easy, but that last 20% will be, can, can be incredibly challenging sometimes. Um, and finally, the delivery mechanism. This is, this is a bit um, you know, from my, my own personal perspective. The delivery mechanism of those services, I think, is very, very important to your users. Make sure that you... To, to the device in the user's hand. I think that's a really, really important point that's often missed. OK, thanks. So, so I think um, one, one more quick question, and then we'll, we'll start to wrap things up. Has anybody got anything else in the audience here that they want to ask? I don't see any hands shooting up at the moment. OK, so, so oh, there is a question at the front here. Yes, gentlemen. Okay, microphone arrived as you'd finished your question. The Sorry, just, just, just really, really the whole policy of onshoring and offshoring and a term we've heard about near, nearshoring and people's opinion, opinion of it is because it does, does vary, does it, does it not? And, and, and I think there are some important you know, points to, to understand about it. Okay. Any volunteers to jump in on that one, Tim? Did yeah, you, you're, looking, like, you're looking I think, keen. Um, well, it's, it's one of those that, that dealing with the public sector, um, 
uh, flushes out because there are some quite clear guidelines on what data can be uh, kept within the UK sovereignty, what can stay within the EU, and what they're happy to let go offshore completely. Um, and that uh, those guidelines existed pre pre Sowden uh, and his uh, unsurprising revelations, to be brutally honest. Um, frankly, on, on that bit, I'd be really happy if NSA or GCHQ are looking at the data because they keep it fairly secret. It's all of the other people that that indicates can look at it, like the Chinese, that, that I'd be worried about, you know, and, and the, the compromises of Dropbox. So, so back to the, the question, you know, if it's data that is important nationally, it should probably be in your own data center. Uh, and certainly we build cloud-like infrastructures inside the data center of a bank um, that probably most of you save with. Uh, because the FCA is forcing that to be kept inside their own data centers, right through to uh, some government data, you know, relating to management systems around their data that we actually just put in a cloud product. You know, ServiceNow is a cloud product, and that passes accreditation. Uh, so, so the government are happy with that, uh, and and everything in between. Right, so I think it is a horses for courses thing. I think there's also yep. a lot of misconception and misunderstanding out there in terms of whether uh, EU is any better or indeed worse than the European economic area or, you know, outside of the European borders and so forth. And, and you know, there's all kinds of legal so, discussions around that one. Simon's itching to say something. So, so I, I, you know, I, I take the physical location off the table here. I certainly strongly would disagree that putting in your own data center, as we've just discussed earlier, makes this any safer. In fact, I think it doesn't. My Brent discussion, uh, you know, proof of point. Um, for UK government, there's very clear guidelines of how this is handled. Um, physical location is important, but actually what becomes far more important and really why UK government is mandating in many cases where data resides uh, nationally is about people and processes. It's about security cleared people having access to that data and the mechanisms that they can control and assure and certified how data is handled. So it's not about where it, where it sits in the location in the UK or outside of that, but they want to certify it, they want to check the people, they want to know the people, they want to have the records. And that's the very, very important point. Just, just add to that, that I think transparency of the information security management system is really important. Uh, with our platform, you can specify a particular location that you want to have your data held in. Just because we have our 11 regions around the world doesn't mean that we ever move data between them. If you put your data in, say, Dublin or Frankfurt, two of our regions, uh, your data will stay in that location. It will not be moved. And then we have an information security management system, which we can provide transparency on ISO 27001. PCI DSS and many other industry specific accreditations as well uh, and you can find a ton of information about that on AWS's website and the same for other providers. I think any credible provider is going to make their information security management system transparent and certainly share it with customers that they have the right sort of uh, confidentiality framework in place with and you should look for that in a provider. It's important to verify that in my view. Just. Um I just want to go back briefly to my point around flexibility I made in the last question. Um, I, I do think there's a solution to every problem um, when we're talking about cloud and even the location of cloud services. Um, you know, we, we mentioned around uh, financial services industry, uh, whether, whether it's right or wrong, that the fact is a lot of financial services companies do like to keep their data on site. Their CISOs are desperate to keep their hands around the data. But and I'm doing this right now with a, with a, with a wholesale bank that you know, they, they're absolutely determined they're going to keep the majority, at least, of their data on-prem. On um, our message to them is that doesn't preclude, preclude you from de uh, deploying cloud. Um, let's, let's work with you to, to make that a cloud-like solution on-premise anyway. And I'm not just talking about the virtualization and automation piece. I'm saying commercially, let's make that more like an infrastructure as a service platform. But also, let's give you the option for your less critical workloads to burst out into a, another, I mean, in this case, our pl cloud platform, or even into a public cloud platform such as AWS or, or Azure. So just because some workloads will want to, well, people want them to stay on site, doesn't preclude that organization from deploying cloud in, in totality. I just wanted to, um, sorry, 
I just wanted to point out and say um, it's quite interesting listening to all of you talking about security and just wanted to highlight, so if you are an SME, this is the kind of level at which the suppliers will bend over backwards to make sure you have the level of security. So again, from an SME's point of view, there is really no reason to worry about security levels in, in the cloud. There is absolutely every security policy you can think of being taken care of by most of the major cloud suppliers, so it definitely isn't a barrier to whatever you want to do. And to be quite frank, if you're a cupcake supplier or something like that, you really don't have to worry about security. You know, this is, this is a fairly significant um, uh, process that's looked into very, very hard. So. Brilliant. Okay, that's an excellent high to end on for all cupcake suppliers out there. Um, thank you. I no, appreciate that. It's good to end on a high with that. Um, right, we are out of time, I'm afraid, guys. So um, I, I, hopefully the panel will be around at least for a little bit. So if you do want to grab them, I'm sure now would be a great time. I'm not sure if we're going to a break, but let me hand back. Uh, so thanks very much to the panel. Please show your appreciation.